For today's project, I partnered with Waterlocks to not only bring you one or two, but three easy DIY gifts. And even though I've been fortunate enough to add a lot of different tools to my shop over the years, I'm taking this one back to the basics. We're using basic tools that pretty much anybody can have in their shop or garage to make three beautiful entertaining gifts that you can give. Then we're going to seal them with Waterlocks' 100% pure tongue oil to really make all of your hard work shine so you have some beautiful gifts that you'll be excited to give this season. For this first project, we are going to be making a breadboard. It's a super easy project that is just going to use a jigsaw. And I've got this beautiful scrap of uh, walnut wood that I'm gonna be using to make mine. This is about six inches wide, and it's actually a full one inch thick. You do not need to have a full one inch thick in order to make a breadboard. Most one by boards are actually three quarter inches thick, which would work perfectly. But if you wanna go with a nice thick board, the great option is to go visit a local lumber yard. Don't be afraid to go to your local lumber yards. They are so fun. Um, uh, so many options when it comes to picking out wood. And just be upfront, go talk to them, say, hey, I'm new, this is what I wanna make. What would you recommend? Can you cut it down? Can I get it plain to the thickness I need? And most of them are very friendly and very accommodating. And a little trip tip for you, is you don't actually have to buy a 10 foot board when you go to a lumber yard. You buy it by the board foot. And so you can say, I just need a 24 inch piece of something. And they can cut that down for you and you only pay for what you're going to use for your project. So let's build this breadboard. If you need to cut your board down to size, then it's time to decide how you want the handle of your breadboard. And this, there's no right or wrong way. I chose to make mine on a slight bit of an angle. So I measured out how long I wanted the breadboard and then drew an angle with a speed square. I freehanded the handle and just kind of guesstimated and sketched it out until I had a design that I liked. Once you're happy with your design, clamp your board to a surface and then it's all about jigsawing. Now when you jigsaw, especially a hardwood, you need to be careful about going around these tight corners. So it's best to go in from one direction and pivot and then connect it with the other direction and that's going to allow you to get into these tight corners. Then you're going to drill a hole in your handle. And I just used a Forstner bit. If you don't have a Forstner bit, you can use a spade bit. The Forstner bits I find give me a much cleaner hole, means a lot less sanding in the end. So I just held up a Forstner bit up to my handle until I found one that was the right size for what I wanted and then drilled it directly through the handle. And now the design of the breadboard is done and it's time for sanding. Because I used a jigsaw, there were some rougher spots, so I started with a 40 grit sandpaper to really shape out this handle and to make it super smooth. Now, a 40 grit sandpaper is gonna take off a lot of um, wood and it'll allow you to really shape anything. If you don't have 40 grit, you can go with an 80 grit or a 60 grit. I just used what I had on hand. A handheld sander can be tricky to get in these tight corners of the handle of my breadboard. I used a set that I bought, it's very inexpensive, and it attaches to my drill. And I'm able to basically get a spindle sandal, sander without having to buy an expensive piece of machinery. And that helped to really carve out and sand all of those nice edges that I just cut out with my jigsaw. Next, I did use a palm router to round over the entire outside edge of my breadboard. The reason for this is it really gives it a nice cleaned up look, but it's not necessary. But if you still want it without having a router, you can round over the edges with your sander. An orbital sander will actually round over your edges very quickly. Once everything was shaped perfectly with the higher grit sandpaper, I stepped it down until I had sanded the entire breadboard up to 220 grit for a very nice smooth surface. You ready for project number two? For this one, I pulled out a bunch of scraps of one by two. Now some of these weren't actually one by twos. I did rip them down uh, from scraps that I had left over, but some of them were actually one by two scraps. And we're gonna make an edge grain uh, cutting board. Now when you're talking about grain, the front, top and bottom of a board, that's your face grain. 
The sides would be your edge grain, and the ends is your end grain. And the edge grain is going to be a really nice cutting board. It's going to give us a really thick cutting board. Because we're using one by twos, we're going to glue them up on the face so that the edge is what you cut on. We're going to have a one and a half inch thick cutting board, which is great because it can be sanded down over the years. It'll last forever. And you can have a lot of fun with the designs based off of the scraps you have. Now, if you don't have a bunch of one by two hardwood scraps lying around, that is fine. You can actually purchase a lot of hardwood scraps at um, a big box store. I've bought them at Home Depot many times before. Make sure you're getting really good hardwoods for cutting boards. And what your most common ones you're going to see are going to be maple, walnut, and cherry. Don't go for an open grain wood like oak because that has open grain where food particles can get into it, makes it really hard to clean. So look for those closed grain hardwoods. You do a quick search, you can actually find a whole list of um, woods that are good for it. If you want to go with something a little more fun, you can go to a lumber store and find a purple heart and a lot of really exotic hardwoods that make a great cutting board. So let's make this one. Determine the length that you want your cutting board and then cut all of your one by two pieces down to this amount plus about a half an inch. That will allow you some extra room so you can square off the cutting board after the glue up. To know how many one by two scraps you're gonna need for the width of a cutting board you want, take the width you want and divide it by 0.75 because the, each one by two board is actually three quarter of, a, of an inch thick. So for my 10 inch board I wanted, yeah, I needed 13.33 pieces of one by two. So I ended up using 13 pieces to give myself just shy of a 10 inch board. When all of my pieces were cut, I played with the arrangement to figure out exactly what pattern I wanted. I'm using three different woods, walnut, maple, and cherry. And again, I was just using scraps that I had left over from other projects. So with the amount of scraps I had, I got to play around until I found a pattern that I liked. Next is the glue up. All of these one by two boards need to be glued together with the face so that they will create a giant cutting board. And you are going to need clamps to do this. I have these nice clamps. You can do it with a little bit less expensive clamps. Use what you have or um, use this as an excuse to splurge and get yourself an early Christmas present. You're going to want to add a hefty amount of glue on the face of all of these one by two boards except for the very end one because that one is not going to be glued to a side. Then stack them next to each other in your clamps and clamp tightly. You're going to want to see some squeeze out on all of those boards and that will allow you to know that you have enough glue to hold your cutting board together. Make sure you're also using a waterproof cutting uh, wood glue for your cutting board because it will be cleaned with water in the future. Let the glue dry completely. I let mine dry overnight. This was a great stopping point and then came back and released it from the clamps the next day. Now you will have a lot of squeeze out from your glue and the easiest way to remove this is actually with a wood chisel or another sharp um, edge and it's much easier to remove this and then sand than to try to sand it because it tends to gum up the sander. So if you have an ability to remove that with a sharp edge, do that first. Typically at this point in a cutting board, people take it to the planer to get it both sides completely flat, but we're doing this with basic tools. So I armed my uh, orbital sander with 40 grit sandpaper and put in a podcast and got to work. It did take about uh, 20 minutes to fully sand off each side and make it nice and flat. And I just kept going with that 40 grit back and forth, keeping very consistent pressure. And then I used my hand running over it to tell when it was fully sanded. Once I had both sides flat with that 40 grit sandpaper, I stepped it down to an 100 grit and did another sanding. Then after both sides of the board were, hap were sanded flat and I was happy with it, it was time to square off the edges. To square off the edges of the board, I used a T-square that I had. Any Thing you have that will allow you to show a square is totally fine and I drew a line to square off both edges. Then I took it to my miter saw 
and cut off the excess. If your miter saw is not wide enough to cut the board, you can still cut it on the miter saw. Just cut it as wide as it goes, flip the board over, reline up your saw and cut the other side and it will actually give you a really decent cut without having to go to a, um, a sliding compound miter saw. Then you're going to go back to the sander and sand everything down to 220 grit. It's time for project number three. Now this one might be the hardest one of all because we're going to make a jig in order to use, do it. I've got this beautiful piece of walnut board that I'm going to make a round tray and it's going to have a lip on it and it'll be perfect for like a charcuterie board or tray or any kind of serving tray. We're gonna make it about 14 inches I think, maybe even a little bit bigger and we're going to make a jig for a router to cut a perfect circle. So I'm really excited about this one. I have not worked with a circle jig on my router yet, so let's get started. Before we can get started on our jig, we first need to glue up our boards in order to make them large enough for the size of tray we want to create. Since my boards were seven inches wide, I decided to do a 14 inch tray. So I cut four pieces of the board that were just over 14 inches long. And then I glued two and two together. Even though it looks like all four are glued together on these clamps, I'm just clamping them on the same clamp, but only put glue down the center seams. And then I clamped those, let them dry overnight. After I let the boards dry overnight, I removed them from the clamps and I turned to my orbital sander again. Just like in the cutting board project, I used that 40 grit sandpaper to remove a lot of the surface at once. And I sand very carefully across the entire board to get a nice flat surface and get rid of any of the lip that might have been created from my glue up. To make the circle jig for my router I used a quarter inch scrap of MDF and I ended up using um, a slightly too small piece when I measured it I wanted to have a seven inch radius for my circle so I only gave myself seven inches on my jig which I should have given myself at least eight or nine inches but I made it work. To create the jig you're going to remove the plate on your router. It usually is held on with just a few screws and then transfer those screw holes and the center to your piece of MDF. Once those are done pre-drill holes. Now the holes for the screws to reattach that to your router do need to be countersunk and then drill a hole in the center big enough for your router bit. I'm using a quarter inch straight cut router bit in order to cut this circle. When the jig is all assembled, add it to your router, secure it with those screws that you removed the original base with and you are ready to go. Before we can start routing out our tray, we do need to mark the center point. Because it's a seven inch radius on our circle, in order to get that 14 inch diameter, measure from the edge of the router bit, seven inches, make a mark, and then you're gonna pre-drill a hole. This will be the very center of your tray. Mark the center of your um, completed boards, those two pieces we made to make a 14 inch square piece. And then you're going to attach the drill, sorry, the router jig to the center. I just used a screw through that hole. And now comes the messy part, routing out that entire circle. You're going to just need to take lots of little passes with your router. I went probably um, 3 16 on each pass and be very careful that the router is hanging off the edge of the board so that you're not turning it on while it's in your board because that will chew up your board. So lots of little passes, make sure that center hole is in the middle and just go around and around until you've cut through the entire first board. With the first board completed, you will remove your jig and repeat the entire process with the exact same hole on your second board. Now it's important that you use the exact same um, center hole because you're basically creating two identical circles and that is going to make it so that lip lines up. Once that is done, you can add a new hole to your router jig for a smaller radius circle. Now I wanted a half inch lip. So I measured from the inside of my router bit and measured only six and a half inches and that gave me the smaller lip. 
Then I attached it to the second board using that same center and routed out the inside. One thing to note is the inside, it was a little bit of a challenge. I was not able to see as easily where the end was and I ended up cutting all the way through and then giving myself a little bit of a bump on my inside lip because the piece started moving. So just really try to pay attention and prevent yourself from that. With all the circles cut out, it is time to assemble the tray. But first I wanted to sand the inside of my lip so that it was nice and smooth. It's gonna be a lot harder to sand once it is attached to the other piece. So I just used a hand sander, I mean, sorry, a piece of sandpaper by hand and sanded that down. Then I lined it up where I wanted it to go. I tried to make sure to completely line up the grain and the easiest part of that was to line up the seam on both of those circles. And I got it all lined up, added glue, and then clamped it really good. It is a little tricky when you're clamping this because it, if you have a lot, a lot of glue, it tends to shift and move. So really try to watch it so it doesn't shift around and slide as you clamp it tight and then let your glue dry overnight again. As careful as you are when clamping up, I guarantee you the edge will not be perfect, but that's okay because we have our trusty sander. So remove it from your clamps and then use your chisel or sharp edge to remove any glue out from the inside and outside. Then I took my orbital sander again, armed with the 40 grit sandpaper, and I used it flat on the sides to really give the edges a good sanding. This does take a little bit of time, but it's a lot of fun and quite therapeutic. And I just went around the entire thing over and over until it was nice and smooth. And you're not done with the router just yet because this tray really looks super professional if you add that round over edge to all of the surfaces. So I did the inside and outside of the lip as well as the bottom. And that inside circle that we cut out for our lip is also a fantastic piece. It can be used as a tray or a serving board or a cutting board in its shape just as is. So I rounded it over as well. Once everything was rounded over, I stepped down my sanding until I had everything beautifully sanded with a 220 grit sandpaper. All of my projects are complete and have been sanded to perfection. I even routed the edges and sanded the inside of my walnut tray. Didn't wanna let that beautiful wood go to waste and it can be used as another serving tray. So now we're ready to seal it. And like I mentioned, we're gonna be using Waterlox's 100% pure tongue oil. This is 100 tongue oil, nothing added to it. It's not gonna create a film, it's just gonna absorb into the wood to protect it, but really make the natural colors of these projects shine. So let's get started. Applying the Waterlox tongue oil to these projects couldn't be easier. You're going to need a lint-free rag, and um, I like to use gloves because this will definitely get all over your hands as you are applying it. And put a good amount on the surface of your first project and then just rub that in. You do wanna make sure you have a good hefty coat, maybe a little more than you think. And you're going to let that soak into the wood for 10, 20 minutes. So I just started with the first project, oiled it up nice on all sides, moved on and did it on the next. And I just love watching the color of the walnut really pop on this tray and on the cutting board, you really see those stripes created by the three different species of wood. Once everything is fully coated, you're going to, like I said, let it sit for maybe 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes then come back with a new clean lint-free rag and you're going to basically just buff off anything that's left on the surface. And this is going to allow as much of that to soak in as the wood wants to take and then you'll take off any excess so you don't end up with any residue or greasiness on the top. Then let your tongue oil seal on the surface or cure dry for 24 hours. If you want to add a second coat, you can but you do want to let it cure for seven days before you allow any water to touch it. So it's a great idea to make your gifts ahead of time and let those properly cure before gifting them for Christmas. And there you have it, three and a bonus amazing DIY gifts that we made with some basic tools. You don't have to have a shop full of stuff to make these amazing gifts. And I just love the way the Waterlox Pure Tongue Oil brought out the natural grain of all of these um, beautiful species of wood. 
anybody would be super happy to get one of these gifts. So make sure to visit me at housefullofhandmade.com for even more amazing DIY gift ideas. And hit like and subscribe if you like this video.